where we start to look at not so much the species by species data, but I start to look at the MPAs and a few other questions that you need to ask before you start to look at MPA effects um, of your data set to make sure that you are sort of on the right track. So um, saw that abundance changes over time um, significantly, and we're still learning new things. And in the last couple of years, we're kind of an eye awakener in where we are in the 35-year data set with the highest abundance or lowest abundance in most of the species. So, but the species composition differ geographically across the islands. I already told you about the oceanographic differences, the warm water and cold water variation with the different species. So you'd expect that data to show, that, that information to show up in your data. If it doesn't, you probably got some problems, all right? So one way to look at that is a cluster analysis. And this is a way, it's sort of like a family tree to see how you are related to your family. Um, but in this case, it's a community of, of species. And in this analysis, if you have a community one and community two, which tends to be very similar in their composition, they're going to end up being very close together in a cluster analysis. Again, just like the family tree where your brother and sister, if you're from the same parents, are going to be very closely related. You'll be best related to your uncles and cousins and, that, and whatnot. All right. So here's community one and community three. They're going to be a little bit different, so they're going to come out a little bit more separate. And then communities that are extremely different, like you'd expect in the Channel Islands from San Miguel to Santa Barbara Island, are going to be very different in, in, in their family, in their tree. So you do that, you take the data, and you do these analysis, and sure enough, you get the pattern that you'd expect to see. Where Anna Kappa, um, we don't have Santa Barbara here, but Anna Kappa is um, more closely related to um, East and Santa Cruz, and so on through the chain um, for invertebrates. So patterns you expect to see. Um, for fish, here we have Santa Barbara included in this. Uh, you'll see actually more dots on this. This is a mixture of both our data as well as PISCO, which is the Partnership for Interdisciplinary um, Coastal Ocean Studies, or Studies of Coastal Oceans, um, out of UCSB and, and the West Coast. And we kind of combine data sets um, in this analysis. And here, some interesting things fall out with fish. Um, here you have Santa Barbara, more, more closely related to um, actually Santa Cruz. And Anna Kappa's got some areas that are more closely related to, um, to Santa Cruz than actually Anna Kappa. And that's because of these upwelling cooling effects of where these fish populations are. So if we were to do some detailed analysis of fish and start to care, compare and marine protected areas that are different on these islands, we actually might want to mix up these sites a little bit. So it tells you how and what you can compare. So um, pretty interesting there. If we take that same analysis and put it on an XY axis, okay, and plot things, all right, you're going to see the outside um, plots or, or, or data points are um, outside reserve in blue, and the red is inside the reserve, so protected areas. And you can see there's a, a cluster here, there's a cluster here, and there's some outliers here. We tend to look at that. There's your west channel, so the cooler part, San Miguel, Santa Rosa. Here's your east channel, it's what you'd expect. You expect those communities to be different. Right, but then you have these outliers, and here's you have the old Anna Capital Reserve that's been um, protected since 1978. It's really different than both those places, which tells you that fishing is having an impact on the system. And then we have the new Anna Capital Reserve that was established in 2003. It's already moving away from the seas channel. So when you protect things, things kind of migrate in a different part of, the, of your analysis. And it's really a couple species that are driving this, and it's mostly the fish species that are driving the system, such as sea cucumbers, which are completely fished out now. Um, sea urchins, um, uh, lobster, and whatnot. So, great. There's the biogeographical components. So, can we observe differences inside and outside the immune reserves? So, monitoring. Again, monitoring was set up not as an experimental um, procedure or, or experiment to look at effects, but sure enough, for 35 years for the data, you start to start to tease out these effects. So, our first attempt at this was about 10 years ago. Um, well, several attempts were made. This is the first one that got published. And again, there's those two sites inside the reserve. Um, remember I told you that that wasn't significantly, statistically significant. It was hard to make a case, even though we knew those sites were really different inside. But just, the, it's a numbers game. And it was hard to get the stats right on it to, to um, convince the scientific community to publish papers. But something happened in, in, in 2003. Um, and that is, people started fishing for sea cucumbers. So gill nets were banned, I think I mentioned that earlier, by the state of California in 1992. Some of those gill net fishermen needed other activities to do, so some of them switched to diving for sea cucumbers. All around the world, um, um, the fisheries for sea cucumbers have been completely decimated. So it's a, they're used as, in soups in different parts of the world, and essentially we've wiped out sea cucumbers everywhere, um, including the Channel Islands at this point. But here at the Channel Islands, you had no fishing. 
from 1980 until 1992. Right? The two reserve sites at Anacapa are the white dots, are the white squares, and the non-reserve sites, which are just five sites near there. So we can go up to San Miguel because again, the community is really different. So we only compare local areas with those sites. Those track the same until you start the fishery. And sure enough, when you start harvesting things to take things out, those populations decline. Whereas in the reserve, we actually saw an increase in the population. Okay. So this is called a before-after control, um, uh, before-after control impact analysis. Okay. So you have the control, which is the reserve sites that were never fished. You have the impact, which is fishing. All right. Really hard to find data sets to use this. It's just by chance that this fishery started and we had 25 years worth of, or 20 years worth of data before we can do the analysis. And this was published because it makes it a very strong statistical analysis because you have all that before data. Okay, so you can imagine, I'll show you the, I'll show you the actually I should have it now. But you can imagine all these oil spills that have happened, starting in 69, XN Valdez, the BP oil spill in the Gulf. Okay, you can, you can see that none of this information before the spill exists. Okay, and if it does exist, it's usually very little, and you don't understand all that big variation. <coughs> I actually think I was talking to somebody doing some settlement monies from the food news spill yesterday, and I actually think that our data is actually going to buy well for the oil companies, because I think what we're going to show over the long term that there's so much natural variation that when we have an oil spill, that impact is going to be relatively low. It's going to be lower than what people think. You know, that's fine. If that's what the best of oil science shows, so be it. But, you know, I'm not so convinced that those oil spills have as much of an impact, at least subtitled. Now, on the shoreline, it's a different scenario. Okay, and the tide pools, it's going to wipe out everything. It will be a huge impact. Okay, but underwater, I think the impacts might be a lot less than what people think. So, time will tell. I hope we never actually have another oil spill, but we have this before data to be able to look at what the impacts really are. So, kind of exciting. I'm going to take the same data that you showed you. So, this was published in the paper if you really want to read about it in, oh, where is it? In, 2001, showed it all. Um, I'm going to take this a little bit further on a paper that I'm working with with a colleague in New Zealand. And we're essentially going to move the data. So here's graphically what sea cucumber populations look like at the Channel Islands. Here we took at um, the pre-fishing data, so 1982 to 1990. We just pulled a chunk of data out of it. And the fish sites are in white. Um, the long-term sites are, uh, long-term reserve sites are in yellow. And the reserve sites were in uh, are in red. Now this is before fishing, so all these, the management action is the same. There's no fishing going on. Okay, this is what the management is today. We have a long-term reserve, we have a shorter-term reserve, and then we've got the areas that are fished. But you can see in the middle of the channel, okay, with the exception of San Barbara Island, which is three sites and a little anomalous, this is where most of our sea cucumber population is, and it's pretty much the same whether you're going to be in a site that's going to be fished or not going to be fished. So then we go and pull some data from after the fishery. So this is about 10 years after the fishery started, 2009, 2011, we, we, we're redoing this. And this is the data you get. Essentially, the only population of sea cucumbers that exist at the islands are in the protected areas. We've harvested everything outside. So we estimate now that there's 20% well, of the area in the park that's reserves. And we estimate that between 65 and 85% of the population of sea cucumbers are in that 20% of the area because we've harvested everything else. So pretty, ama pretty amazing. This has happened everywhere on the planet. So people think that you know we're better off in this country, how we manage our fisheries. And we're pretty much just like every other country for the most part. We're a little bit behind the times, I think. Um, some places like Baja have way more active fisheries management programs. What that data looks like, um, oh, sorry, this is what happens when you blue slides. So, this is the information I, sh I showed you before. Um, the only thing here that's a little bit more complicated is the red has been added, so you can not look at this at all. The red is the reserves since 2003. All right, so we pulled out the sites that were gonna become reserves in 2003. And you can see here, the old reserve and the new reserves pretty much track each other, okay? The fishery starts, all right, and outside the reserve, of course, it's the, those fishing resources go down. And inside the new reserves, which is also fish, also goes down. And then you have the new reserves established in 2003. So here you have no fishing going on. You add fishing, okay? And then you have the new reserves where you take away fishing from some of those sites 
And sure enough, you see those red sites increase once you take away fishing. Mm -hmm. And they're now almost after 10 years at the same level as those old reserve sites. So it took about 10 years for cucumbers to recover if you start protecting them again. But this is a lot, almost like two Bakke analysis now, where you had a before and after control, but with and without fishing. So it's pretty much unprecedented, unprecedented in the scientific community, and we're, we're hoping to get this information out soon. Um, there's supposed to be some blocks in there. So you can imagine if we had another similar spill, like what happened in 69, with all these sites, both on the intertidal and subtidal, we're going to be able to have some, some understanding of what the impacts really are from an oil spill. Again, I hope this doesn't happen, but oil spills happen. Right? It's unfortunately true. How did all of us get here? Any, any of you ride your bike today? Okay. So who's the blame? Oil companies or the users? A little bit of both, I think. I think we all have to take responsibility for our actions. All right. So now I'm going to really just talk about the marine reserves 2005 to present. Um, so I'm going to be looking at these comparisons here of our, our setup, which is a little bit more of an experiment. experiment. We have three sites in, three sites out, these four marine protected areas. And um, we can ask questions like this size um, and density change inside versus outside the reserve. So essentially, are they working? We remove fishing effort. And if we look at um, the fish species, this is, is, um, looks complicated, but it's actually pretty easy. This, this is a ratio of, of greater than one and less than one. If you're greater than one, you're more abundant, okay, inside the reserve. If you're less than one, you're less abundant inside the reserve. If you're red, you're a species that's targeted or fished. If you're blue, you're a species that nobody harvests. Okay, nobody really wants sea stars. And you can see there's a, ah, there's a much higher proportion of um, fish that are more abundant inside the reserve than outside the reserve. Um, a lot of here along the line, and we're, we're in the process of redoing this with a few more so the data, but the trends are pretty much the same. Um, if we look at fish species and look at reserves, we'll take this a step forward and we'll just look at the uh, scorpion reserve. How many of you have been to scorpion on, on Santa Cruz Island? Raise your hands. Okay. There's a new pier, temporary pier there. Um, and we have three sites in and three sites out of the reserve, but how many dots do you see on the board? This is what I'm going to see if you're paying attention. You see. Toll sites, yeah. So <laughs> Pisco, we pay Pisco to go out and do monitor our sites to get a little bit higher resolution of our fish data. Now we collect this information ourselves. But we, they divided our site into two to have a higher sample size to give it a little bit more statistical robustness. And if we look at a couple species of fish, this is what we get. So here's sheephead, and this is abundance we're looking at. And it's paired up with the reserve from a geographical perspective. And you see the highest abundance in the middle of the reserve and it's lower at the edges, and it's pretty similar inside versus outside, except for the edges. Anybody want to explain why you think it's the lowest right here? I know that there's a fisherman in the room. They should be able to explain that. Where do you go fishing? Yeah. But where do you want to fish if there's a reserve nearby? Along the edge. Along the edge, because you think you're going to catch the big fish. Mm -hmm. So the highest amount of fishing pressure we see here, which is really prevalent with lobsters, where there's a wall mm -hmm. of traps. You can't even cross on a boat, it's, it's so, so dense. So people are fishing really intense here, and actually you're probably better off catching fish a little bit further away than on the edges because there's so much fishing pressure on there. So, but what else does this also tell you about this reserve? So the reserves were set up to be this big. This is one kilometer. So this reserve is one, two, three, it's like four kilometers large. It's a very small reserve. It's less than, it's about two miles, okay? So this tells me that sheep are being protected in only this much of the area. So is this reserve effective for, for protecting sheephead? Definitely not in the full two miles of it. All right, so are the reserves too small? It's a question that we're trying to get some more information at, and it's a really a same question we'll probably try to get funded for in the next, next five or 10 years. But um, to me, these reserves are too small because there's so much of an edge effect, and it's very, very pronounced. Everybody's fishing along the edge. And fish move, sea cucumbers move, lobsters move, and so the reserves are not as big as they were originally set out to be. And we have a whole lot of little ones, so there's a whole lot of edge effects that are a cumulative issue. So if we take this and we look at uh, pill bass, it's pretty much the same scenario. And we're in the works of, of reading on this analysis as well, with a few more years with the data. All right, so what about invertebrates? All right, we have a similar scenario for the fish species, but not necessarily for the other species, where three of the four fish species are more abundant inside the reserve. Um, and um, red urchins are about the same. 
Um, and that's because there's a lot of red urchins, or there used to be a lot of red urchins, and the fishery only culls out the largest ones. But it seems like that population is relatively stable. And then there's a whole lot of these species that look like they're less abundant inside the reserve. And we think that's because inside the reserve you have all these big, nasty predators which are eating all the invertebrates. All right, so reserves don't protect everything. If you're a prey item, you're probably not going to be happy in a reserve. You're probably happy outside of a reserve where there's no more predators because humans like to consume the top predators. Lobster abundance. Another species I thought, oh my gosh, we're not monitoring lobster well. We really need a program. So our transects are permanent transects, and we're never set up in areas of really good lobster habitat. And um, we had relatively low densities with the exception of a couple sites. They happen to be the reserve sites because they happen to be a little bit better habitat for lobster than a few other locations. But those reserve sites also had a lot of lobster in them. So I thought it used to be habitat. Sure enough, what's happening outside the reserve is over the last 10 years or 13 years since these areas have been productive, the lobster population has skyrocketed. And lobsters like to use the best crevice habitat available. But what happens when there's you notice in classrooms, this classroom is set up so people can't sit in the back, but you go in the classroom. <laughs> Where is the prime habitat in the classroom? It's in the back, right? Everybody wants to sit in the back. This is actually a really neat design for your classroom. That's because we nobody, set it up that way. Yeah, nobody, 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 nobody wants to sit in the back. For lobsters, they want the best crevice habitat, okay? But when the population of crevices fills up, so if you wanted a back seat row, you've got to show up a little bit early, right? So when the population of crevices fills up, they move out into less, better habitat. And that's what's happening at all of our sites. So it took a while to see those population increases, but as the lobster population increased, we're now seeing more and more on our transects, and we're seeing those densities go up dramatically. So in effect, we're actually monitoring the lobster populations pretty well. Just not really well when they're at low densities, because we don't have that prime backseat habitat that they really like. That's a new analogy for me, by the way. <laughs> um, we also don't measure lobsters, but it's quite obvious, and there are some studies that have happened that larges are lobster inside the reserve. So um, 10 years ago, you would be pretty hard pressed to find one or two giant lobsters um, outside those areas that aren't protected. Now we see them both inside and outside because they're moving around all the time, and you see dozens of these really large lobsters around. And they're really important from a predator prey component. So what about, what about fish? Are fish bigger inside the main reserves versus outside? So you go out and size fish. And sure enough, that same, same sort of thing, where the, this is actually all, all, all National Park Service data now, where anything to the right of the line is bigger, anything to the left of the line is, is bigger. Um, kelp rockfish and tree fish, actually, these are not really harvested too well, but they are listed as a harvested species. They're not harvested really? much, sorry. Yeah, there, there's a little harvest that goes on, but not much. When there's nothing around. Unintentional? Um, direct when there's nothing around, people will harvest them. They're not highly targeted, though. Hmm. So um, sure enough, we don't see much of a change in those, but again, similar types of scenario where, um, yes, fish are larger inside the reserve, okay? And egg production on fish, uh, this is um, reserve non-reserve ratio. Again, um, as fish are bigger, they produce exponentially more eggs, and so we're seeing a much higher egg production inside the reserve versus outside the reserve, and so size does matter if anybody asks you. No chuckle, great. <laughs> I'm going, I'm going too long. Not even Sean talked a lot about it. All right. And so if we look at some of these individual spe species, this is where I probably should do this out because your eyes are probably glazing over at this point. These are all the fish species. All you really need to garner from this. Um, there's some ver various size restrictions, but all the ones in red are more abundant inside versus outside. And this is important because you can see with the size, though, or, sorry, larger inside versus outside. You can see outside the reserve in blue, there's hardly any legal calves on. So any fish, any calves on becomes legal size get harvested. And only inside the reserve do you see these, these legal size cabins on. It's the same thing for um, blue rockfish, not so. They're not, it's not a heavily targeted fish. Um, ocean whitefish, huge difference. Kelp bass, legal size versus non-legal size. There's a lot more legal size kelp bass inside the reserve. Um, same thing for sheephead. Um, ling cod, huge differences. So ling cod are just super dumb fish. They eat anything. And um, they're amazing predators, so they really eat anything. But there's your size limit. You become a legal size thing cod and you get taken. Luckily, a lot of them survive. What are you laughing? Can you share a story with us? Sure, I can share a story. So, we go fishing a lot in the gap for rockfish, and my dad and his best friend give me a hard time because I always catch the ling cod, but I won't touch their teeth because their teeth are very big. Early. So, we have to stick a rag in their mouth. So, my dad's best friend stuck the rag in his mouth and he goes, I dare you to bite me. And he, the ling cod bit him in his 
gum was gushing with blood. It was nice. Just, oh. <laughs> he dared him to bite him, and it just, it bit him, so it's just a funny story. Now he's like, you and won't, won't touch this gum <laughs> <laughs> like anymore. Yeah, the, 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 the Fish pretty, Revenge. They're pretty amazing types. So that's also a species that it doesn't do too well in warm water. And so we do these fish counts, and we saw virtually none in the 80s and 90s. They didn't really start to come back until, until um, the late 90s. And now they're, you know, they're pretty common, but they're heavily impacted by fishers. Right. Here's the non targeted species, and it's about 50 50. And again, we think a lot of these species are actually less abundant inside of the reserve because they're really good prey items for the, for the predators. Okay. So a little bit more variation there, but that's what we think is going on. So um, I got a few more slides, and then I'm going to show you a 10 minute invasive species talk and see if you guys can make a decision for us. That's a management action that we're, we're dealing with right now. Actually, no, I'm going to skip this because I already, I already, I already, I already did all this. So let's just skip that. All right, lots of people involved in the project. Um, almost 400 divers to date. Um, it's mostly funded by the Park Service, like 99 percent of it. Um, if you want information and you look up Cold Forest Monitoring National Park Service, you'll find some information. There's also a publication out, um, Ecological Archives, where you can get our data up until 2013. So if you want to do some exploratory stuff, we are going to hopefully have, by the end of this year, next, next year, maybe by spring, an um, online application where you can go and, and graphically look at our data and figure out some of the patterns yourself, where you could um, manipulate our data, compare urchins and kelp, urchins in temperature, or urchins with fish, or what have you. Um, so hopefully that will be up and running. We've had that once before, but it's been a bit difficult to maintain.